All right, guys, this is your chapter five lecture. Um, today, I'm gonna cover chapter five. I'm gonna do a separate lecture for chapter six. Both of these chapters are relatively small, but I'm gonna do them in, in separate lectures so that you can stop and answer your review questions. Couple of uh, housekeeping matters. Number one, some of you have reached out and said, hey, I'm doing all these questions in the book. I can't keep up. You don't need to do all the questions in the book. Do the assignments that I give you. If you look back at your modules, you'll see them listed there by each module. Just because there are questions in the book, I'm not looking for those answers. I'm only looking for the assignments that you are to submit to me. Number two, please follow directions. I've had more of you have trouble with the uh, following of directions than I've ever had in the past. And I think that's because you're just rushing through and not reading directions. So please take the time to read directions. The third thing that I will say is your killer paper will be due soon. I will have to use a rubric on this one. So while I understand that you can go to artificial intelligence and get a paper printed out, that's all well and good, except artificial intelligence is not going to know my rubric and the questions that have to be answered. So please go back to the questions that I ask you that have to be answered in the assignment and make sure they are answered. All right, we're gonna start in on chapter five. Remember that the one thing, if you only learn one thing in this class, it needs to be that the three pieces of the criminal justice system are the police, courts, jails. Police, courts, jails. Just think about the fella who is involved in a crime, the system that he's going to pass through. The police will get him first. They're going to send him to court. And if the court finds him guilty, then he's going on to jail. So we're following those steps. So chapter five, we're going to start studying the police a little bit more in depth. And of course, as I said, I think in one of the early lectures, you can't study something of today unless you look and see how did we get here? What, what was the history of this organization? So that's what we're going to look at today. Not long, and I will tell you in this lecture things you need to know and you do not need to know for your test. So it would probably behoove you to actually watch the lecture. By the way, as an aside, YouTube tells me how many times each video has been viewed. So I have an idea of how many people are watching lectures. Okay, let's start back in the development, the historical development of the police. Our police forces actually are based um, in English roots, meaning as in England. Um, over there, they started out with organized posses of citizens if you're like me and you've ever watched any old Western shows, they would get a posse together to go chase the bad guy. And it's just a group of citizens who uh, take off after the bad guy. Back in England, when law enforcement started, this organized posse was led by the leader of the county, and their term for that was Shire Reeve. Shire Reeve. Does that sound like another term we still use? Shire Reeve? It sounds like sheriff. So that's where you can see the roots already. Or the comms stabuli, which was the mounted officer in the area, a comms stabuli. And although we don't have constables in our immediate jurisdiction, constables are still part of our law enforcement as well. So this is again, back in England when it started. Um, bailiffs and night watch, were also used, um, they were basically watchmen. So almost the same thing, if you think about it, they weren't bailiffs as you and I know bailiffs today in the courtroom. These were bailiffs that were watchmen out in the community. In 1285, that's the year now, 1285, that's how old we're talking about, the statute of Winchester codified British police policies. So what happened is, is that we finally got organized. The statute codified what the police had actually been doing. And now we came up with much more organization. 
So out of this, what you need to remember are the Shire Reeve and the Com Stabuli, and that our law enforcement is based in England, English roots. So by 1720, gin was invented. And the plus for gin is that it was strong and it was cheap. So all, a lot of the poor people in the ghettos began binge drinking and all of a sudden crime just shot out of the wazoo. There were too many for bailiffs to control. And literally these gin riots contributed to the growth of modern police forces because it went on for like a hundred years. And because the crime kept going up with all the drinking, um, they had to get more and more police officers. So it really forced the modernization of the police forces to get more officers and get them better organized. In the early 1700s, there was a guy named Jonathan Wild, and he ran this large criminal organization. He had robbers, thieves, and burglars. Um, he would basically get them to steal the stuff and then he would turn around and sell it. It, it really was an organized crime um, situation he had running there. And what was formed to try to take care of it were the Bow Street Runners. Henry Fielding was a magistrate on the Bow Street region of London. And he, um, came in and basically broke up that ring. He he arrested Jonathan Wild in 1725. And the Bow Street Runners became the best of what uh, London had to offer. Like they were like, you know, when we think about the Navy SEALs being the toughest and all, the Bow Street Runners became known as uh, the best that you could find around. Um, John Fielding took over when Henry died in 1754 and kept those Bow Street Runners Bow Street Runners rolling, and they were just very widely respected. The London Metro Metropolitan Police Services, they were all otherwise known as the Met or Bobbies, and the reason they were um, known as Bobbies is because Sir Robert Peel is the one who founded them in 1829. And they really were the first modern police force. So why did they get the name Bobbies? Because of course, the nickname for Robert is Bobby, one of them. And they became known as the Bobbies. Um, they were handpicked men um, who really, he began, he gave some real strength and organization and purpose. And when I say purpose, it was formed for two key principles. He thought that it was possible to discourage crime from ever happening in the first place. So he came up with preventive patrol. So preventive meaning we're gonna stop it before it ever happens. They all became uniformed. They all adopted a military administrative style. And to be honest, they were not immediately well received. They began patrolling the streets by walking beats and um, this, as you know, put so, as you can guess, put so many more police officers out in full view because they're out actually patrolling the streets. So um, you need to know about um, Sir Robert Peel and the Bobbies, uh, that that was the first modern police force. So let's get over to America and see what's happening here. Again, early American law enforcement was based on British experience. The problem is, is that our landscape was so totally different from, say, England. Um, over here, we had colonies, remember, when it started, uncharted territories. We have population that's spread out. We don't have bit the big London. We don't have the big cities yet, right, when American becomes into um, existence. And as the population began moving west, we got what was known as the Wild West. And it really began with vi vigilantism. Vigilantism um, was um, people who kind of took it into their own hands. Um, this was Judge Roy Bean or Wild Bill Hickok, if you've heard some of these people from books or movies, Bat Masterson, Wyatt Earp. Uh, Pat Garrett. They enforced the law on the books 
and standards of common decency. So it was really the people taking the law. They weren't organized police over here. They were they were vigilantes, which is the public taking the law into their own hands to enforce. Now, this just shows you kind of a timeline. You don't need to know this, but this just kind of shows you a timeline for what was going on over here. By 1658, you do have paid watchmen in New York City. By 1693, we got our first uniformed officers. By 1731, we got the first neighborhood station. Now, remember the Bobbies were created in 1829. So America saw the Bobbies created and somebody made a big donation to Philadelphia and Philadelphia went and created their force. 1844 is when the New York Police Department formally formed. 1855, the Boston Police Department formed. From 1895 to 97, you may recognize the name Teddy Roosevelt. He was the New York City Police Commissioner. And he put in call boxes to rapidly report crime. Well, you can think about call boxes and, and you still can see these set up in some places, uh, maybe parks, you know, where people are out and and hiking through and every now and again you'll see a phone there to be able to call back and get help um you can see where that would get police quick more quickly to the crime because you wouldn't have to get all the way back over there to report it in person you could call it in of course he went on to become president of the united states but when he was president he also was the one that organized what he called the bureau of investigation which later they changed to formally call it the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which is the FBI. Now, here come the 1900s. And let's think about this. And y'all, I think about this with my mom because my mom is still alive. She was born in 1927. She's 96 years old. In her lifetime, the changes that have occurred, think about telephones, radios, regular communication. They didn't have that before the 1900s. And oh my goodness, automobiles, now they can get there. They don't have to rely on horseback to get there. Um, now they have a, you know, a car, a, a truck to get there. So rapid, affordable transportation. All of a sudden your police force becomes much more mobile and is better organized because their communication improved so much. Now let's get up to 1920 and prohibition hits. And some of you will recognize what that is, but prohibition was when the government said, no more alcohol. We don't need our general public uh, drinking alcohol. Well, our general public's gonna get to alcohol. <laughs> That's just the way it is. So what happened was we ended up with a lot of bootleggers bootleggers were the ones that were basically sneaking the alcohol in. They were getting paid to get the alcohol and get it out to be distributed. Um, the problem when you try to put in a, you know, really stiff law like that, that people really didn't want is that you put your police in a situation to, to be easily um, swept into corruption. And what I mean by that is the bootleggers had plenty of money to pay off the police to look the other way. So the police come out with money. You know, they individually are making more money with the bribe money. The bootleggers get their loot through without being harassed by the police. And the general public's getting their alcohol, which is what they wanted as well. By 1931, the Wickersham Commission was formed. And they released a report that was one of the most important events in the history of American policing. They are the ones that came out and said, this prohibition law is unenforceable and it carries a huge potential for police corruption. Now that doesn't seem like it's a real genius remark now, but back then for this commission to come out and say that, really realizing and putting in writing that some laws are unenforceable and because of what they are or what they do, they raise the potential for police corruption. That actually directed law enforcement for years, really through till about 1970, that report. 
In the 60s and 70s, remember we talked about this in the first chapter, the political environment is changing because civil rights are expanding. So more people are standing up and saying, me, I have rights, my individual rights. Um, you have more, um, you know, protests, marches, those types of things as, as people fought for their rights, whether it be race or gender or ethnicity, um, all of those issues are now being put out into society. And 1967, the president had a commission. And what that commission found is that um, the police are just isolated from their communities. They're sitting in their office they're responding to what they have to, but they don't really know what's going on out in the community. They're not really involved in the people's lives. Well, about the same time, we're in 1969 now, the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration. It was formed and its purpose was to assist police forces in obtaining assets and training. They had money, they had money to give away. And because of this money, they it was taken and used to try to solve problems uh, through a lot of research. They did a lot of research in trying to um, come up with best police management styles, best policing styles itself. You know, do we want to have them out walking beats or do we want to have them in separate neighborhoods? Do we want to have one big police station? What is it that the general public needs and will help us to be the best police we can? And what came out of that is what's called scientific police management, meaning they're going to actually look at um, the study of police administration. So I used to have a great video that was on YouTube. And they took it down. And I'm really sorry for that because it explains scientific police management very well. In total, the definition that you'll find in your book is the application of social science techniques to the study of police administration, reducing complaints and enhancing use of available assets. And the, the heyday of this, although it ran from about 1969 to 1982, the heyday, the main periods of it were in the 1970s. So what they would do is um, do, they would use different assets to study policing. Now, the video that I used to show, I wanna say it was out in California. And what they ended up doing was using their computer because of course now we have the, the advantage of having computers that can help us study and compile information. They would look at the times that, um, the times that crimes were committed, the types of crimes committed, and the area where the crimes were committed. And all that's fed into the computer. And what they would do from that is they would vary their, their scheduling of their officers to try to address those places at those times, specifically looking for those crimes. So that's just an example. What's interesting is that the big one that got... Um, Probably most people who study the history of police, I'm assuming they would say it's the most famous application of the research principles was called the Kansas City Experiment. And this one just kind of blows my mind, to be honest with you. So they divided the Kansas City, actually it was Southern Kansas City, not even the whole city, to 15 areas, but they kept it secret. Nobody knew what area was what. In five of those areas, they left their usual way of doing patrol. In five of those areas, they doubled patrol. And in five of those areas, they didn't send out any patrol. They just, officers were just sent in if there was a call for a crime. And what came out, and to me, surprisingly, was that there was no difference in the rate of occurrence of crime or in citizen fear of crime. So you'd think, well, these people who live in that second area that have patrols doubled, they're seeing more officers than even usual. That didn't make them fear any, feel any better about you know, whether they thought they were gonna be a victim of crime. Um, it's just interesting to me. To me, it seems almost unbelievable. And wait till you see the other finding. 
Um, well, let me finish this one and then we'll get to it. But anyway, the studies affected the managerial assumptions. The police had always thought that double the patrol and people are going to feel a lot better. It really wasn't. Um, and so what came of that is new patrol strategies. And kind of like I told you, this, this um, study they did in California, they used directed patrol. So maybe certain times of the day, based on the frequency of reports, they're going to assign people to attack that. You know, that's when you're going to work or at these certain times of the day, uh, because the frequency of this type of crime and these reports goes up. We're going to split the force. Some are going to do patrol, but we're going to have some some others who are assigned to specific tasks. And we're going to have to prioritize calls for service. Um, when I say prioritize calls for service, what that means is, you know, who is in the most need the, the, at, the, at the very moment? In other words, if, you know, the hostage situation and he's holding a gun to the lady's head, we got to get there quick, as opposed to... Um, you know, some other, maybe something disappeared off my back porch. It, that's not an emergency, so to speak. It's something that needs to be reported, needs to be investigated. We want you to find the stuff and find the bad guy, but you don't, it's not something that would go above priority wise an ongoing situation where life and, and um, you know, life is in danger. Um, so they use now that what with, with, with we hope that scientific based management or research has done, it's it's given us the best possible research on the outcomes so that we can um, evaluate how our police departments are working. Um, it still remains the single most powerful force for change in policing today. It's scientific research. You know, I, you kind of think back to if you would have had to in, in high school do a science experiment and they taught you how you have to control certain factors and only change the other factors so that if the result is different, you know it was a change in those factors. Just think back to that. That's what science is, right? It was your um, hypothesis of what you thought was going to happen and then you applied the, um, the whatever it was, the experiment that you were doing and then coming out with the results. So evidence-based policing is still out there today. Um, okay, let's skip on over to what's going on today. So American law enforcement is the most complex in the world. It's broken down into three levels, and you're going to find these same three levels when we talk about courts and also when we talk about jails. So you have the federal level, which is the country right? Federal government is the U.S. government. You have state police. That, of course, are, is within your state. They have jurisdiction within your state. And then you have local police, which for us would be our parish, our sheriff's office, and also our city police. Gonzales City Police is an example. And then we also have private security firms out there that do work. They're not employed by the government. So you've got the three different jurisdictions, um, governmental jurisdictions, and then you have private security. So we're going to talk about the federal agencies first. Federal law enforcement agencies, um, they have them in 14 different U.S. government departments and 28 non-departmental agencies. And I'm going to look in the book because they have a really good listing Again, I have the actual um, printout of the book, so I'm not sure about page numbers, but um, on page 148 of the book, it lists the federal law enforcement agencies, and that's everything from the U.S. Forest Service to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, um, Internal Revenue Service, you can look through that list and get an idea, but those are the people who have jurisdiction. Their agency is the country. It's it's our nation, the United States. They can do the same things that you probably think of local officers as doing. They can conduct criminal investigations. They can do search warrants. They can make arrests. They can carry firearms. We're just not used to seeing what we would equate to either a state trooper or a local sheriff. We're not used to seeing a federal person walking around but there's a lot of them out there. They just don't look like we see walking around in our little 
town. Here it is. I'm sorry, I didn't for, I'd forgotten it was on the PowerPoint. This is the table that you should be able to see in your book. So you can see all the different agencies and then their law enforcement um, arm of that agency underneath. You probably didn't think about the Postal Service having a law enforcement arm of it, the Postal Inspection Service. Um, you may have heard of the National Park Service. You may have heard of the Coast Guard, the Secret Service. So some of these you have heard of, some of them you haven't, but that's all at the federal level. Now, of course, the most, I guess, famous one at the federal level is the FBI. And the FBI's mission is to protect against terrorist and foreign intelligence threats. It enforces U.S. criminal law and provides leadership to law enforcement agencies, meaning local law enforcement agencies. It is the one, if you watch any of the whodunits like I do, when they put the guy's DNA through CODIS, I sent it through CODIS. Well, there you see what CODIS is, Combined DNA Index System. That's CODIS, that's run by the FBI. The FBI also has a laboratory division and they will process uh, evidence free of charge. I would love to get the take on some of my students that are with the um, sheriff's office this semester to tell me how it how does the FBI lab become involved in any of your investigations? Because I was told in the past that we really didn't send much off to the FBI because you didn't want to release the evidence. In other words, send it off and, and lose that evidence potentially. But anyway, I would love to for somebody to email me or uh, start a discussion board or something on whether the FBI's lab really um, is used by our local people. They do have a counterterrorism division. I ha I've attached a YouTube video here. It's pretty interesting about jobs in the FBI. And, you know, you don't hear very many people say, oh, I want to grow up and be an FBI agent. But what they do want um, is people who have other talents. You think that it would only be somebody who knows law enforcement. No, this, watch this video and it's going to give you an idea. They love people who know different languages. Um, one guy he talked about knows different architecture all over the world. So that when, when they get surveillance um, pictures in, they, he can tell so much from the architecture involved. It's amazing. They actually want you to go out and have a career. They need accountants. They need, it's amazing if you watch the video and see, I have a future daughter-in-law that my son's engaged. And I always told the little girl he's engaged to that she needed to end up in the FBI because she went to college and got her degree in criminal justice and minored in Arabic. Now, can you imagine how, how helpful somebody knowing the Arabic language would be? Um, that's the kind of people that they're looking for where you have some other skill or talent that will be useful to them. But I'm not going to take the time to watch the video, but I would encourage you to do that. So now let's jump down to state level agencies, state level agencies. Um, mainly, this is going to be you and I think of state police wildlife and fisheries. Some of the state university police people are considered state level agencies, alcohol and tobacco, the port authorities you hear about sometimes, and way stations. Those are all state agencies. Um, I'm going to be skipping over some of chapter five. If it is not in this PowerPoint and me discussing it, you do not need to know it for your test. So just realize if you're one, and I have several who are reading the chapters, if I don't mention in this PowerPoint, it was intentionally pulled out. You're gonna see some of that. If you find the centralized model and the decentralized model, we're not going over that in here. Let's skip down now to the local agencies. The local agencies, that's a wide variety. We've got city departments, which you know GPD is a city department. It's the city of Gonzales Police Department. You have sheriff's departments. All of our member, our, um, my judicial district that I go and and to the courthouses is Ascension, Assumption, and St. James. Well, all three of those have a different sheriff. So they're all run by different sheriff departments. You also have sometimes specialized groups um, where they are either on campus, maybe they're limited to campus police, and we're talking about university campuses. Um, maybe the transit police, there are some who are assigned to only um, the transit, you know, subways, that type of thing. And you could be talking about one officer to tens of thousands. I mean, you can, we, we drove to North Louisiana one time and for a softball tournament, 
this was years ago when my daughter was playing, you know, fast pitch as a kid. And we're driving through some little bitty town in North Louisiana. And my mother told my husband, you better slow down. They got speed traps. And sure enough, here he gets, he's going through some little bitty nothing town. And the fellow that comes out to write him his ticket is, he looks like he's about 20 years old. And he is the, he's the chief. He is the police department. He's it. <laughs> He's the whole police department in that little town. So you could be talking about little bitty agencies, or you could be talking about tens of thousands. What do you think the New York police department? Oh my goodness. You know, that's, that's huge. Um, now this, you do need to know, and this is very important. Sheriff's departments run the local jails. Okay. So all three of our parishes have a local jail in it in Ascension it's right across the Sunshine Bridge right there in Donaldsonville. That's the Ascension Parish Jail. In Assumption, it's right, it's not too far from the courthouse. And in St. James, it's literally connected to the courthouse. Those are run by the sheriff's office. So if we could go to the jail, which I used to do with my in-person classes, you would see Ascension Parish Sheriff's deputies in there working in the jail. It is also local sheriff's departments that serve court papers. So anytime a suit is filed and um, it has to be served on the person so they know to come to court, that is also the Ascension Parish Sheriff's Office. You will see them driving around sometimes in their, um, they look different. But most of them that I see, and this may be wrong now, but most of them that I see are in the white cars with the smaller logo and they don't have the big lights on top and all that. Those are the ones who are probably out serving papers. They are also required by statute to provide courtroom security. So if you come to my courthouse, any of the courthouses, you will see that local sheriff's department as the security. They'll be at the front door. They'll be in the courtroom. Now, um, here in Ascension, our sheriff does uh, hire what I call civilian bailiffs, uh, we call them blue coats at the courthouse because they are not actual uniform deputies. They are hired to just come in and do security for us, and they don't wear a uniform. Uh, my uh, usual bailiff is Mike, and he is a uniformed officer, and he does you know wear his uniform and is usually assigned to my courtroom unless uh, he is needed somewhere else. So you do need to know this: who runs the parish jails? the sheriff's office, who serves court papers, the sheriff's office, and who serves, I mean, maintains courtroom security, our parish sheriff's office. Now, the private sector is really the biggest one around. These are people who do not work for the government. They, The government might hire them to provide services, but they don't, they're a private company, private security sector. Uh, it's grown tremendously. And if you look at this last sentence, this is the one that kind of blows my mind. The money spent on private security exceeds the combined budgets of all law enforcement agencies at all levels. So if you add up federal, state, local, governmental budgets for law enforcement agencies, private security, it, more money is spent on them. So it's becoming and has been now a very important part um, of the law enforcement community, so to speak. Um, you're gonna recognize some of these. This chart is in your book also. And page 156 in the real book. These are some of the ones, and you may have heard of some of them, Pinkertons, you may have seen them driving around, Wells Fargo, you see the armed, uh, armored cars, sometimes armored trucks. Um, sometimes if you watch the whodunits, you see them too, like somebody, you know, stole the money out of the, the armored car, the armored truck. Um, that's airport security. They're usually separate bank guards sometimes or a separate, they're separate people who are hired to, to they're not working for the government. They are working as private individuals, um, and it's just huge. It, it's 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 huge. Um, the mall, you know, I have a friend whose brother is a city police department, Baton Rouge City Police Department officer who's been signed, assigned to the mall, but he doesn't go in the mall 
to do arrests. They have their own mall security. He is on the outside of the mall. So just interesting that private is so, so big. Um, you know, the whole, those who, who want to criticize, try to say, well, the private and the public are, they don't need to compete. We need them um, building partnerships. And that's probably true, but I think there probably are some partnerships there. But this um, statistic, 85% of the nation's critical infrastructure is protected by private security. So you're talking about the, the infrastructure, the, 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 the main cornerstones, um, you know, airports and hospitals and that type of thing where you, it's not, it's not necessarily governmental officers that are in there. It's, it's just for you to understand how important this private security sector is. Okay. That's going to be the end of chapter five. Remember, if we didn't go over it, you don't need to know it. It's a fairly short chapter. It's not that complicated, but I've tried to tell you as we've gone through this, there are certain things you do need to know. You can stop now and go do your chapter five review questions, which I would suggest. I will do a separate video for chapter six.